Normally I present to you some charming story or bit of fact in this opening section, which also serves to allow me to introduce the concept of the episode and summarize previous episodes for the benefit of those just joining us. It's a fun little way to get things started, get people caught up, and it helps get things rolling right away. Today, though, things are a little different. See, all along in this series so far, I have maintained that there is a lot of ground to cover when talking about the history of magic and how it interacts with the role-playing games we all like to play. Games such as Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, 13th Age, and so on. You know the ones I mean. Mostly those set in a pseudo-medieval fantasy setting, but also games like Star Wars where the magic is really space magic that all of us could tap into if we just had enough green wobbly bits in our blood, or Deadlands, where the magic is really the manipulation of spirits and the ability to have a really good poker hand. They all seek to model a process to a greater or lesser degree whereby people can cause various effects to happen to themselves or others by various supernatural means without having to do all the hard work of making it happen by more regular methods. It's fun to shoot fireballs from your fingers, but not if you have to go to all the trouble of buying fireproof gloves, learning how to make napalm, loading it into a pressurized canister, and then taking out the appropriate insurance, which absolutely no one will sell you. We've covered quite a bit of it so far. We started in ancient Mesopotamia, traveled through Egypt, and ended up last week in the Hebrew and Judaic traditions. Along the way, we discussed the benefits of being a public blesser, but private cursor, why getting along in the afterlife was so tricky that you had to have outside help, and why chicken soup was for more than just the health of your soul. Altogether, it has been about 30 centuries worth of history we've looked at so far, if you don't count the unknown amount of prehistorical time when magic was a thing but people were so busy keeping ahead of the local saber-toothed tiger that they didn't have time to write anything down. But that's okay. We've hit the high points and given you the big picture, just what you needed to know to understand the discussion we would have to have when it finally came time to really dig into Dungeons & Dragons magic using classes. But there's a problem. See, the closer we get to modern times, the more there is to cover because more information exists. And it's not even just pure regurgitated through an AI information. Anything that has been around as long as the concept of magic has, has got its mitts into a whole wide range of things that deserve talking about in their own right. Unfortunately, as fond of digression as we have been over the years, there's too much involved even for us. We might lose our way down one particular path of digression and never find our way back. So even though we've already dealt with about 30 centuries of info, there is still enough left over in the remaining 20 or so centuries between then and now that another three episodes could be produced and we still wouldn't get to where we really want to be, which is discussing how all this works with our favorite games and just what Gary and crew were trying to do. Or thought they were trying to do, anyway. To make matters worse, quite a lot of it from here on out would be a repetition of things we've talked about already. There's Pliny the Elder, Hermes Trismegistus, and Helena Blavatsky, the Greek and Persian Wars, Zoroastrianism and Spiritualism, and our old friends Darius, Xerxes, and Otanes, plus loads of stuff about amulets and potions and magic scrolls. All of it is relevant, all of it is important, and all of it has been covered before by one of the several forms of us involved in the show over the years. If full explanations of each of those topics need to be presented to you in this series, well, you might just as well put all our old episodes on infinite loop and keep doing that every time you get to this point in the discussion. Instead, a proposal. In the famous words of the well-known Spanish philosopher Inigo Montoya, no, the other famous, no, on a bit from there, further, third act, At the castle, with Wesley. Yes, those famous words, that's right. To quote the well-known Spanish philosopher Inigo Montoya, Let me explain. Nope, there's too much. Let me sum up. Let me sum up the most recent nearly 2,000 years of the history of magic in as efficient a manner as I can manage in this one episode. All in one go. 
Yes, undoubtedly, some favorite bit of it will be skipped or summarized too succinctly for everyone's pleasure. But we need to get this out of the way to get on to the other stuff, and we can't just skip it because it isn't unimportant or irrelevant, but neither does it need a deep treatment. We need to know it, we just don't need to know all about it. Besides, just calling some of it to mind should sufficiently refresh the memory of most folks to cover all the salient points on their own. So forgive me for not giving you that usually very entertaining, if somewhat lengthy summary of events in the series to this point so far, in order to remind you what we've been talking about, and instead plead for your understanding as I deviate from that plan and instead summarize all of the history of magic from about 100 BCE until somewhere around 1800 CE, in 5,000 words or less. That's about 2.6 words per year. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Perhaps you'll remember back in episode 2 of this series that we briefly discussed the etymology of the word magic. In that discussion, we talked about how magic originally came from a Persian word, magu. I even made a joke about it not being a nearsighted old man in order to help it stick in your head. Well, you should also recall that because of a quirk of the way Greek works, when they grabbed the word, it became two other words, megos and magia. Gradually, as the Greek language continued to develop, both these words picked up negative connotations because, historically, the Greeks did not get on well with the Persians. See the episodes. At the same time, the word magi, which also derived from the Persian magu, and you've almost certainly heard of that before, came to mean the Persian practitioners of magic, which were in opposition to the magic and religion of the Greeks. Along with everything else the Greeks didn't like about the Persians, Persian words in general were no good bad as well. Magos, in particular, came to mean something akin to the word charlatan, which basically means someone who practices fraudulent magic, whose rituals were bad and ineffective, and, why not, while you were at it, someone who was just generally strange and dangerous. A theme which will continue to pertain to magic and the people who claim to practice it throughout the coming years. Naturally, this meant the Greeks possessed their own form of magic, distinct from the Persian variety, and indeed they did. Primarily, it involved the practice of burying curses meticulously inscribed on wax or lead tablets throughout the town, with the aim of inducing adverse effects upon individuals, groups, or institutions they harbored disdain for. For instance, if dissatisfied with the trajectory of a court case, one would seek out an artisan skilled in crafting these curse tablets. After specifying the target's name in the designated blank, yes, seriously, you would receive a slender sheet of inscribed lead adorned with various dangerous implements like nails and blades. Following this particular transaction, you would proceed to bury the tablet in the courthouse while uttering a few unsavory words, before taking your place in court and glaring meaningfully at the unfortunate subject of your legal opposition. The hope, of course, was that they hadn't reciprocated the same curse upon you. For those inclined to escalate matters, adding a lock of hair or a piece of clothing from the intended victim, along with a miniature effigy, heightened the essence of the curse. Oh, and let's not forget, you could even resort to a love tablet intending to lure your desired individual into appreciating your etchings, so to speak. Eventually, the Greek Empire diminished, and the Romans took over running the world. It's a well-known fact that there was nothing a Roman loved more than the Greeks. In fact, the Romans loved the Greeks so much that they almost would rather have been Greek than Roman, and so did everything they could to adopt as much of Greek culture, society, religion, government, and magic as they could. So they too decided the Persians were bad, and that their Magos kind of magic was terrible, except they called it Magus and Magia, because that's how Latin worked. And like the Greeks, cursed tablets were A-OK, -okay, peachy keen, fine. Except they took it one step further. The Romans decided that Magia and Magus was so bad that it ought to be illegal, 
and so they wrote laws outlawing its practice and making it punishable by, depending on the sanity of that day's emperor, fines, imprisonment, or death. Our old friend Pliny the Elder, see the episode, even went so far as to say the whole rotten idea of magic altogether had been come up with by the Persians, particularly Zoroaster, see our Darius episode, and was imported from them by the now supposedly magical military leader Otanes, while he was out on maneuvers subduing the Ionians for Xerxes. You guessed it, see our episode. In fact, why not just go ahead and re-listen to the entire Persian series and get it out of the way? How Otanes did this, and why Pliny was so sure of it, no one quite knows. But Pliny was the last person to be pinned down by inconvenient facts when a good unsubstantiated rumor was laying around just waiting to be picked up. If nothing else, it probably helped sell books. Unfortunately, it also got you out having picnics while volcanoes erupted. Years later, when medieval and renaissance alchemy practitioners were doing everything under pseudonyms, Otani's name and variations on it would crop up again. Eventually, though, the Romans sort of got tired of the whole thing. Magic of any sort became illegal, and those who practiced it were in for a rough time. Partly this was due to the growing influence of Christianity among both the Greeks and Romans. By the 400s CE, the Romans were writing the sorts of laws that meant if you held any official position in Roman society and were ever referred to as a magician by custom of the people, in other words, if you were just generally called a magician, whether you were or not, you were up for a round of punishment and torture, regardless of what your rank in society was. High or low, no magicians need apply. Thank you very much. At about the same time, the newly developing Christians lifted the Roman and Greek concepts of magic, which was, after all, where a lot of their early ministries were located, and made it a part of their theology, negative stereotypes and all. They also drew from Judaic tradition, since that was the foundation of Christianity, and made many of the same distinctions as they did. Some types of magic, reinforced by the methods of Jesus, miracles and prophecies and such, were okay, provided they could be shown to be from God. And here is where the split between our two types of magic, theurgy and thaumaturgy, really begins to split. By and large, as long as you had the right credentials, and it could be shown that God had in fact granted you permission to carry out good works in his name, and so on, your magic, which was obviously divine magic, was okay as far as the developing Christian church was concerned. Anything else, including non-divinely inspired prophecy, which as you will recall you could tell wasn't from God because it failed to ever happen, various forms of protective magic that relied on something other than faith in God to work, and any magic that attempted to influence other people to behave in certain ways, say by falling in love with you, or giving you lots and lots of money for no particular reason, buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback, were no good, very bad indeed. Engaging in such magical practices marked you in the eyes of Christians, Romans, Greeks, Jews, and Muslims, essentially the predominant authorities of the time, as at the very least a pagan, and most likely it implicated you in consorting with malevolent spirits. As medieval times unfolded, the mere suspicion of being a mage or practicing magic had the potential to land you in considerable trouble virtually anywhere across the known world. Worse still, just being part of a competing Abrahamic religion, that is, those religions stemming from the traditions and beliefs of Abraham, so a Jew, Muslim, or Christian, could get you suspected of practicing magic. Who knew what those other religions got up to behind closed doors? Why, they could be doing anything up to and including fraternizing with the devil himself. So we'd better do something about it before they get out of hand. Get the fires going. We'll be back by 10. And if you happen to be a competing Christian religion, even a competing very similar except for one tiny detail about the proper way to pray or baptize or whether one specific word belonged in the Bible or not, Christian religion... Well, it was a short trip from there to an accusation of heretical practice and using magic that would quite frequently end up with you and all your fellow heretics going to ask God about it all quite a bit earlier than anticipated. Don't even bother starting the fires, we'll kill them where they stand. Despite 
the pervasive prohibition of practicing magic and the imposition of severe penalties, the clandestine world of magical arts not only persisted, but flourished. Astonishingly, those fervently opposed to its use often found themselves complicit in its proliferation. As highlighted in our previous episode, a diverse array of spiritual and physical remedies for illness and healing practices continued to thrive. By the onset of the 14th century, Kabbalah had evolved into two distinct branches, one a theological pursuit with a focus on meditation, and the other a continuation of practical Kabbalah centered on remedies and protective magics. Islam, demonstrating a nuanced approach, carefully differentiated between healing magic and sorcery. The belief held that magic used for healing or safeguarding against possession was considered a divine gift from God, practiced by those who demonstrated obedience to the divine will. In contrast, sorcery was viewed as emanating from devils and jinn, achieved through sinful acts and sacrifices pleasing to those malevolent entities. The Christian church, despite its overt stance against magic, exhibited a degree of tolerance toward certain forms, provided they were perceived as divinely inspired. Amulets, talismans, potions, chants, dances, and prayers comprised common elements deemed divine if inspired by God and pagan if not. Feel free to check out any of our episodes on those topics in our back catalog. In general, the overarching theme seemed to be, regardless of the religion it stemmed from, whatever magic we do is fine and good and proper as long as we do it in the name of our God and with his approval. But any magic you do, regardless of source, is clearly bad and wrong and should be punished immediately. Especially if your people are weird and different and maybe don't speak our language or come from here or if we're in competition with you to put butts on the seats, or if we just generally don't like you. However, once out of the medieval period, magic underwent a sort of renaissance of its own to complement the larger renaissance of more mainstream society. As alluded to in an earlier episode, the main cause of this shift was a refocusing on what was called natural magic, which saw magic as a whole in a more positive light. According to Italian humanists Marsilio Ficchino and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, natural magic was perceived as an elemental force intricately woven into the fabric of natural phenomena, far superior to the notion that magic stems solely from demonic sources. To them, natural magic resonated with the harmonious rhythms of the cosmos, akin to the unseen and omnipresent force of gravity. Just as gravity governs the motion of celestial bodies without arousing ire, natural magic, they argued, operated seamlessly within the natural order, deserving of understanding and exploration rather than condemnation. Imagine the frustration of dropping an egg or an expensive plate or stumbling over the dog in a dark hallway. All are part of the unyielding pull of gravity. Yet, despite the occasional mishap, humanity has come to accept and understand gravity. Similarly, Ficchino and Pico advocated for a nuanced understanding of natural magic, believing that its comprehension held boundless potential for human advancement and enlightenment. Fortunately, you'll have heard a lot about natural magic thanks to our many references and episodes about Hermes Trismegistus. So you'll hardly need me to tell you that natural magic came to include things like astrology and alchemy, because you'll be able to look those episodes up yourself and enjoy them for either the first time or all over again. You see, we really have talked a lot about magic before now. Numerous endeavors to fathom the intricacies of natural magic or decipher the insights of those who professed comprehension laid the foundation for the explosive acquisition of knowledge that defined the Renaissance era. This surge in understanding catalyzed the emergence of figures like Newton and Boyle during the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods. These intellectual trailblazers delved into disciplines such as alchemy, ultimately contributing to the evolution of chemistry. While the alchemical dream of transmuting lead into gold remained elusive, the journey proved immensely fruitful. Along the alchemical quest, discoveries abounded. Transformations of lead and various chemicals into new substances were unveiled. Each mistake in the pursuit of alchemical transmutation became a stepping stone documented for posterity. The resultant wealth of knowledge became the cornerstone upon which subsequent generations could build, gaining genuine insights into the workings of the physical world. The crux of the matter is this. 
As the 17th century unfolded, discerning between natural magic and the burgeoning field of science, which had been evolving alongside it, became a bit like telling apart twins with ever-changing haircuts. Distinctions existed, no doubt, but they weren't as pronounced as they would later become during the full-on takeover by the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century, leaving everyone scratching their heads and asking important questions like, why isn't my lead turning into gold like these ancient texts promised? And why do my experiments have such an alarming tendency to unexpectedly go boom? Once these perplexing questions started cropping up, it dawned on folks rather swiftly that a good chunk of those venerable texts were less scientific insights and more like an assortment of mystical malarkey. This realization hit especially hard when you were hoping to make strides in the shiny new realms of chemistry, astronomy, medicine, and geology, among others, all of which had their roots in the natural magic of the time. If you aimed to grasp the inner workings of the world you inhabited, you couldn't just cling to outdated notions. You had to ditch the mumbo-jumbo and embrace a more fact-based approach. Otherwise, you'd be stuck concocting your own version of reality, selling a handful of ancient books based on it, and missing out on the actual progress happening around you. As the methods and knowledge of science grew and firmly established themselves, the reliance on magic, whether of the natural or supernatural variety, began to wane. Thanks to its own tomfoolery, magic found itself with a tarnished reputation, and any attempts at a PR makeover went down the drain. Adding to its decline was the budding Protestantism sweeping through Europe, a new religious movement that didn't shy away from employing magic as a negative descriptor. Much like its early Christian predecessor, Protestantism wielded accusations of magic to impugn the practices of the Roman Catholic Church, contending that many of its rituals bordered on idolatry or magic and lacked any basis in a proper Christian faith. This shift gained momentum as more individuals gained access to the Bible, enabling them to scrutinize its contents independently for themselves. It became glaringly apparent that numerous practices of the 17th century Catholic Church seemed to lack biblical endorsement, raising concerns even among Catholics themselves. This discrepancy between practice and biblical foundation led to a deluge of written defenses to salvage the reputation of Catholicism from the accusations hurled by the growing Protestant movement. The increased scrutiny led to an even dimmer view of anything even remotely approaching magical practice within the church. However, the Protestants, far from being content with critiquing the practices of their Catholic counterparts, soon turned the same critical lens on one another. Differences in belief, whether large or small, became the catalyst dividing the Protestants into different denominations and driving them apart. In a curious turn of events, the Protestants found themselves deploying similar tactics against each other, diverting their focus from the original targets of the Catholics to internal theological disputes. Remarkably, a parallel scenario unfolded in the Islamic world around the same period, as divergent beliefs sparked internal tensions and debates. The quest for religious identity and orthodoxy, coupled with the questioning of traditional practices, echoed across religious landscapes, shaping the intricate dynamic of faith and belief during this transformative era, all of which led to a diminishment and rejection of magical practice and influence. Yet, amidst the theological discord that spanned across Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim communities, there existed a unanimous concern that transcended religious boundaries. The ominous specter of witchcraft, or, depending on your perspective, the equally dreaded accusation of witchcraft, which some argued was nearly as pernicious. To grasp the gravity of the situation, let's rewind to the Middle Ages. See, genuine witches were a rare commodity, some might even say non-existent. And if there weren't many real witches, what was the deal with all these witch trials going on? To people who knew better, it soon became apparent that something fishy was happening. Questions arose. Who were these countless individuals being accused of practicing witchcraft if authentic practitioners were few and far between? The enigma surrounding the scarcity of verifiable witches fueled the paradox of accusations, turning them into a perilous and perplexing facet of medieval society. 
The accusation itself had morphed into a potent tool, a weapon of convenience wielded not against genuine practitioners of witchcraft, but against those who had become, for lack of a better term, inconvenient. And people who were sufficiently inconvenient, say because they wanted to marry your son when you didn't want them to, or because they knew who the father of their suddenly unexpected child was, or because they lived way out in the woods and were a bit eccentric, or you owed them some money, or because they were your political enemy and had more or less been directed by God to protect their country against yours in a surprisingly successful way, were suddenly discovered to be witches all over the place. In the eyes of those wielding the accusation, the Bible's unequivocal statement, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, served as both the moral compass and the blueprint for action. What was an honest, God-fearing person to do but start piling up logs, your honor? If we ignore this bit of the Bible, what does that say about all the other bits of the Bible like the Ten Commandments, Reverend? It sure made it very easy to get people you didn't like out of your way if you could put your finger right on the justification for it in your favorite Holy Scripture. And it wasn't even you doing it. It was God telling everyone else how it had to be. You were just pointing out God's wishes to the rest of the community. And if anyone dared disagree with what the Bible said, well, there were plenty of other trees in the forest to deal with the heretics. The accusation of witchcraft became a dark dance where personal vendettas and societal biases intertwined with religious conviction, leading to a perilous and troubling chapter in history. Fortunately, Inasmuch as it could make a difference to someone determined to light other people on fire, there were people who knew better. Witch hunts did not go unresisted, and there were procedures in place in an attempt to stem the growing tide of people being burnt at the stake. Several of them dealt with those who found it far too easy to accuse people of witchcraft, so that the accuser had to be very careful not to find themselves in jeopardy. You just needed a punishment for false accusations that made the accuser think twice. And the trick is, there were those who knew that every accusation was false. If a free man accused a free woman of witchcraft or poisoning, because apparently poisoning was also nearly as bad as actual witchcraft, then the accused could either try to find 12 people to swear she really, really wasn't a witch we promise, thereby outweighing the word of the accuser, or they could get one of their relatives to challenge the accuser to trial by combat. If they lost, the accuser would have to pay a fine on top of maybe losing the trial by combat and also now being dead or severely wounded. Sending a clear message against frivolous witchcraft accusations doesn't get much more direct than imposing fines and settling matters through a physical showdown. You might also be interested to hear our episode titled Ordeal to see how else it could go. Leave it to good old Charlemagne to take it a step further, though. He declared that anyone who accused someone of witchcraft and caused them to be burned at the stake should himself be executed. Period. End of sentence. You make the accusation and someone dies because of it, you are now also dead. Could not be simpler. Similarly, the Lombard Code of 643 warned against killing people presumed to be a witch. Like the Frankish king, it scolded individuals for entertaining such beliefs, and tried to put the kibosh on the whole thing, bluntly stating, It is not possible, nor ought to be believed by Christian minds. There's no such thing as witches, so knock it off, you dummies. And the total difference it made was... about zero. And thus, the narrative trudged along in this fashion for a considerable stretch. Witchcraft accusations continued to spark like wild embers across the countryside while the perplexing realm of pseudo-scientific natural magic tangled with genuine scientific pursuits practically everywhere else. Oddly enough, neither of these phenomena endeared magic to the masses any more than it had previously. Come the late 1700s, magic had quietly receded into the background. It no longer occupied the minds of people with the same intensity as other pressing global matters, such as political revolutions and the birth of new nations. However, pockets of interest in magic persisted, with individuals who have previously graced this show making a return, alongside some new faces. And in the next episode, we'll acquaint ourselves with key figures from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries 
who left their mark on the ever-evolving world of magic. Thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. A heartfelt thank you to those who've chosen to support the show or have generously renewed their support. I understand life can take unexpected turns, and your presence, whether returning or new, brings immense joy. Crafting this show is my livelihood, and your contributions are genuinely deeply appreciated. If you've ever considered lending your support or contemplating a return, now is the perfect moment. Every bit counts, and you can join our magical community by contributing as little as $2 at buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback. Your support isn't just a boost, it's the life force that keeps this show thriving. Let's weave more enchanting stories together, because with your support, the journey continues. Thank you, dear listeners, for being the magic that fuels this adventure. If you're interested, you can always find a link to the show Discord at fiddleback.me. Come join us on the server for mostly terrible puns, discussions about various games, books, and tea, and whatever else comes up. As a bonus, if you subscribe on Buy Me a Coffee, you'll get access to a super secret set of rooms in which hardly anyone is ever burned at the stake. Usually. This episode is a Fiddleback production and was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Find more episodes at gmwordoftheweek.com. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions, home of minimalist acoustic music for production and pleasure. Visit them at sessions.blue. Witches were a bit like cats. They didn't much like one another's company, but they did like to know where all the other witches were, just in case they needed them. And what you might need them for was to tell you, as a friend, that you were beginning to cackle.